Welcome to Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you be the best tabletop role-playing game that you can. Whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level, I am Sarah. I'm Robin confused. We are having <laughs> some technical difficulties. My my clock says we still have a minute and a half to go here. I agree. I and... think with the show starting off, the schedule on the recording started off. Oh, on a, on gotcha. a back shift. Okay. So okay. That is the problem with future dating things, and this is why we need more engineering. Yeah, but... this is why we need hey, some engineering. After so... 200 episodes, if it's only happened once, that is not bad. That's true. I will take That's that as a That's very true. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yes, we are We are grossly sorry about we this. We will so... clean some of this up in I post. I will be cleaning this up in post, so. Alrighty. In any case, uh... So yeah. how are we doing, Rob? <laughs> uh, besides the fact that it's just been a weird week in general, mm-hmm. um... It's not been too bad. Like, I've had a pretty relaxing time. I apologize if you guys hear the, the, the pot in the background, too. We're still boiling, so. Um, but, uh, no, it's been nice. It's been nice. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, weather's kind of been nicer, you know. Got yeah. out, did some good walking, had a nice relaxing weekend. You know, so overall, I was. Uh, it's been pretty good. Been reading some interesting news that I'm not going to get too deep in, but uh, if you're if you're following any of the the D and D stuff that's been uh, that's been slowly trickling out about uh, where things are headed with fifth edition and what what is not sixth edition that won't be existing, uh, I I would look into that to see if you have interest in that because I've I've definitely been reading some interesting things that I'm not certain are in stone yet, uh, but it feels very much like they have a direction that they've put the ship in and uh i'm not necessarily comfortable with it you know uh, yeah i mean I, I i don't it's not like it wasn't foreseen yeah that's the things i'm not i'm not really surprised about it no, so no, no. you know when when things when things that they have talked about i mean they've they've talked about for a while how like fifth edition was going to be the last edition one D D was not going to be a new edition of D D. it's going to be just updates of the of the you know the to the existing fifth edition rules yes technically everything's going to be you know back portable mm-hmm. you know sort mm-hmm. of thing everything's gonna be fifth, fifth edition compatible yeah um so, I mean, honestly, any of these new developments of, like, talking about going, you know, going purely digital where they're not going to have book releases or whatever like that, not really surprising. No, Considering no. how much they've thrown into D&D Beyond, how mm-hmm. much they've thrown into digital products and VT, in their own VTT and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but we've definitely had some, I mean, I would say moving on to other fronts, uh, what was it, uh, 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 Cobalt Press had their huge Kickstarter that just, that I think is just finished or just... Just hit it, hard funding I, of like a ridiculous amount. Yeah, some of that for uh, their Project Black Flag. Um, the, yeah. It has a proper name now, and I forgot what it is. Uh, it's like you know, Heroes of Valen lore or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Tale, uh, Tales of the Valiant. Yeah, Val- maybe, Valiant. maybe that yes. one. Yeah, that was the one that we were looking at. Uh, and I was actually just going to look it up real fast to see where it where it hit because uh, I, I I caught the news quick this morning. Mm-hmm. Um. And, uh, no, it's not Tales of the Valent, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, it still has 29 days to go, and they're at a half a million. Oh, jeez. So, uh, not, yeah. Not bad for a little indie RPG project, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's there's a lot going on out there in indie projects, and I, I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. I think all of this uh, coming together uh, at this time has been... I, I guess inspiring, mm-hmm. um, and I, I definitely will have to agree that I've seen a lot more chatter on Reddit about people looking for other games or preparing to shift or or shifting and then not feeling comfortable and looking for help. Mm-hmm. So it's there's definitely been community drives and directions, which is nice, um, and it's it's exciting to see some of the <laughs> some of the old conversations coming back up with new storytellers and getting good support out of it yeah yeah uh, and just seeing people more interested in in st- in telling stories again um so either way it sparked some inf- you know inspiration and discussion in a in a in a definite positive way yeah yeah definitely um i, I will say with with regards to Cobalt press though mm-hmm. um i i the the reaction i saw on reddit was overwhelmingly tepid okay uh, just just the lucast warm reaction I have ever seen to a, to a new project and announced. Um, and that was simply because it's like, uh, I I, I haven't personally looked into it, and it's simply by it by the reputation it's had in the RPG community. 
um, of essentially just being a slightly cleaned up and house ruled version of Fifth at D and D. And it's like uh, a lot of uh, the, the, I think that's the reason why a lot of people were very tepid on it is because they were looking for something that really broke the mold. Mm-hmm. And it looks like Cobalt Press, you know, shifted a few things around and then just used the same mold. You know. Yeah. And um, then we've and got it's a little disappointing, you know. Yeah, and then I think the other big news thing was the the Critical Role's new setting and system. Yes, actually, I think tomorrow is going to be the first episode of their. Um, is it uh, Candela or Candela uh, uh, Obscura? Candela Obscura or something like that. I think is the name of the show, but yes. the actual system it's using is. Uh, Illuminated Worlds. Thank you. That's what I was just their, looking for. One of their own proprietary systems. Talison Jaffe is one of the writers on it, mm-hmm. um, and I'm very excited to see uh, what it how, how it plays out. It's a yeah. Victorian horror uh, game system, uh, game setting system uh, that looks really interesting. So yeah. uh, I'm definitely gonna gonna pop a squat in front of my TV uh, tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern time and. Uh, Give, give that a watch. Yeah, I think it'll be. I think it'll be well worth it mm-hmm. uh, to 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 see where that drives into. I I still think it's going to be great storytelling as it always is. Oh sure, with wonderful sure. acting. I'll put that word down. And especially when they when they do like their their big production things of like oh this is a limited run like people people really go that extra mile when it's not their everyday you know, hundred and fifty episodes of campaign you know for a Critical Role. It's like yeah. a short run four game thing. They go into the, the costumes, the sets, the everything that's on there. It's it. really I, – I love that. I yeah. absolutely love that. Yeah. It, it, it feels fun. I've always wanted to do that for, like, my own games, but I've never had the guts to ask that of my players. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, the first time I really thought about doing it that way was doing just a single night one shot mm-hmm. of uh, Baron Munchausen. Oh, and yeah, having okay. everybody come as their character because one of the best ways to do it is you literally send an invite to the person – that as the character. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, and so they know who they're playing, but leave plenty of space for them to generate everything else. Like it's a name and a title. Mhm. Mm-hmm. But that says it all, right? And now now you now you make a character around that and come into play. No, that's pretty cool. And uh I I think with the, you know, uh, and specifically with that game, the idea behind that one I was going to do and Vicky and I've talked about a lot is you know, you have four or five people who are the players but there are invites for the galleries that sit behind those players. Mm. So they have an entourage that's like hyping with them, you know, that goes along with the story. So they might have like, you know, depending on how the person wants to do their entourage, they, they know of other guests who are going to join them and they can put them within the same setting. Mm -hmm. So you can have like the adventurer, right. And then the mystic, you know, and then, you know, uh, the businessman, you know, or the mobster, and you know they have their clique mm-hmm. that sits in the room, and it adds to the flavor. You yeah. know, so I, I like that concept. Uh, but extending that to like a full table of players is always interesting, and then staying having the energy to come in costume in character is a lot. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. Demanding. It is a lot to ask. So, like I said, I've never, I've never had the guts to be like, "Hey, guys, what if we dressed up?" Like, you know, but. Uh... I, I I almost did for Sean's first session in Nova Praxis. Uh, my character has a very a very uh, particular aesthetic um, that's pretty accessible, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I just I just didn't. Uh, no, I could see that. I didn't, I didn't think I'd be comfortable uh, sitting there like that the entire game session. So. Yeah. Um, I know for I had considered doing that when I get the. Uh... The Savage Sea designed game that I'm working on, mm-hmm. I, I plan on running that in in character and costume. Oh, nice! Because nice, uh, nice. it's uh, I, I've I again like refined more and more things in my head this weekend because I had the the mental space for it, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I like where I'm going with it. Okay, okay. But I don't think I have a system yet because okay. I think it's going to depend on the players. Okay, fair so, enough. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely looking at it that way, which kind of leads us into tonight. Yeah. So, this is a continuation. Part two of yes. our little dissertation on combat. Yeah, so th- this one is focused on really the question of when does combat end? Mm-hmm. And examining the question initially, we both, you know, when we're talking about combat in general, and I think what jumped out of this as, it's, as an independent thought was the fact that combat's too long, mm-hmm. that we often draw that line out uh 
just in a sense that doesn't that it feels it's, it's too much. Yeah, it e- destroys the pacing. I, I would say you know D and D of course is the you know most popular system you know arguably in the uh, uh, in America of course uh, in you know most English speaking countries. Um, and even people who love and live by and die by D and D, like a great many of those people, will say like, "Yeah, combat just takes forever." Yeah, you know. I mean, in in if we look at our our popular media, we look at our books, we look at our stories, you know, our TV shows. Combat it usually ends with a few things: either death, near death, you know. You know, maybe there's a conversation or a monologue that occurs from the dead person or the person talking to mm-hmm. the near dead person, you know, um, in chase, an escape of some kind, you know, whether it's successful or not. Um, retreats yeah. happen all the time. Um, and, and sometimes just a stop, a realization that this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the whoa, 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 this is too much, you mm-hmm. know, kind of a moment. But if we look at tabletop games specifically RPGs in the last, I would even say 10 or since, since the inception with OSR was pretty obvious that it was really just a board game. But once we moved away from that into role play, um, it didn't change. We still only have death and incapacitation. Yeah. Those are the two things that end combat. Yep. Because there's nothing in the book that talks about any difference. Mm -hmm. And that's harsh. It's, it's hard as a storyteller because, and we see this when with balance, mm-hmm. people talking about balance in games and, and making those kinds of things. So you end up talking to your players about, you know, the, the conversation at the table often opens with, you know, are we going to murder everything? You know, is that what the players are going to be there? Are they just going to go around killing everything? Yeah, sure. Or at know, least it should be a discussion at the table. You know, I, 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 fear that too many tables are not having that discussion oh i agree i agree i think that's more of a meta discussion so but yeah. it should be an open discussion i agree yeah you know um is so you know i i, th- I think that's 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 really the point though is, is this should be it should be a table discussion like uh, during your session zero especially um you really need to have that discussion about like okay are we just going to be murder hobos or is there like a sanctity of life kind of important in this one you know um yeah. What are the expectations? And you know, we. I, I want to get this off 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 my chest, like here at the beginning of this episode too, because um, we're going to talk very specifically about you know the getting away from the murder hobo end of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's your game. We're not here to tell you how to have fun. You know, this discussion is geared towards people who want other options than murder. Right. Um, but like. This is by no means aimed at people to say, like, you know, if you play that way, you're bad. Correct. If that's what your table's enjoying, like... There's nothing wrong with that. It's a game. Have fun with it. You yeah, know? I mean, if you're morkborging and everything is, is MDK, murder, death, kill... Yeah. Okay, enjoy yourselves. Look, if you're, if you're playing Merkborg, you're all dead anyway. Yeah, so. you you were dead to start with. Right. <laughs> um, why did you even give yourself a name? Because um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It yeah. won't help. You're all red shirts. It's all going to go bad. Mm-hmm. Um, that, the worst Morkborg sci-fi game ever. Red shirts. Oh, all red shirts. All yes. red shirts. Yeah. Yeah. You just have a last name. You don't even have a family. Nothing <laughs> matters. Um, but the idea of that it's not inherently there, I think, comes from a lot of places. But and I'm going to say it like we got pretty deep in the weeds with this discussion on how far we wanted to go in this and realized how much of this really went into our next episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think... Tonight, we're going to frame tonight with combat is happening. Yes. With, that's a decision that's already been made. Now it's a matter of what do you do now that combat has started? We're going to talk about that thing that is not in the book. Right, right. You know, How does this have to play out in a way that does not end in the obliteration of one side or the other? Yeah, because again, the book is very clear. Books are usually very clear about what that means, mm-hmm. you know, but they're not very clear about the what other things are there and i'm and we're not also talking to the games that have you know you know that that already explicitly talk about consequences and things like that um which do a pretty good job of of going around that mm-hmm. um but yeah like sometimes it's explained during the setting mm-hmm. and maybe not explained in a great way like 7th c 
does a job of talking about chivalry and that dueling only occurs in sanctioned events between swordsman guilds member. So like, you're not just going to pull your sword out on, on, on the road and, you know, uh, cut down a highwayman, right? Mm -hmm. That's not something that you might pull it out as, as, as like a defensive maneuver, but the idea that that highwayman is going to cut you or hurt you in some way is brutish, right? That's just not going to happen. And yet, all too often, because the game is full of mechanics that involve sword play and gun play, you get into it. It just happens. Yeah, and it, sure. it, it, it's, it feels like it, it's supposed to be dangerous. Well, we talked about this uh, a little bit when I uh, last time I mentioned uh, Vampire the Masquerade. You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, or the game design was largely based off of you know the the typical game design in that in in in, in that time, which was Dungeons and Dragons, you yeah. know, which was a heavily combat based game. So you've yeah. got you know this game that's supposed to be about you know political intrigue and subtle maneuvers in society and stuff like that, and influence peddling, and then you've got these robust combat rules. And guess what people did with their vampiric powers? Killed. Yeah. I'm DK. Mm -hmm. I'm going to control you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do all the bad things. And I'm not saying that, you know, politics didn't happen, but, you know, the, the number of gaming sessions I was in that turned into just uh, superpower blastoramas was, you know. Yeah. But yeah, you you, 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 you give the players those, those combat mechanics, they're bound to use them, especially if you don't set some proper expectations about how you want them to be used. I mean, even in Sean's Nova Praxis game that we're playing, yeah. um, he made it very clear, and it's in the system very clearly, that weapons are not something that's available. In fact, you have to spend points just to get a registration to be able to have one of these things, mm -hmm. and it can be revoked very easily. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yet the entire group was trying to figure out how we could make sure we had weapons because there's this incept in our minds that we're going to have combat. Mm -hmm. Even though that was clearly stated. Yeah. And when we did have combat, it was vicious. It was. It was horrifically vicious. It was. Um, And... Uh, and felt as dangerous as it should have felt, mm -hmm. which is great. Like, that's that's good. We were all concerned about it. We we still have to have, like, our wrap-up to talk about what happened, which I think <laughs> is going to involve a lot of throwing up and trauma and yeah. drinking. Like, um, but that's the thing is, is that y you can set these expectations, but I still think at a table, at a typical role-playing table with players who have played something that even felt like OSR. Mm-hmm. That's in their head space. That's, yeah. that's sitting there. It's a role-playing game. Of course you're going to kill your problems away. Well, yeah. What else would you be doing? Right. Yep, yep. Oh, we're just playing 7C? Cool. That's a, that's just a game about, you know, 17th century swashbucklers that yep. kill their problems yep. away. Yep, that kill their problems away. Yep. Yeah. Um, so not only do I think this is a great, you know, like, you really should be having these during your session zero, during your world building, so mm -hmm. set those expectations early on, but, like... I think it's also very important to have those, like, reinforce those expectations um, mid-game, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we we talk a lot on this show about how you should constantly be having a conversation with your players about the game, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, I think I think people got it in their head in the wider gaming community that you just, you just lay some ground rules during session zero and then nobody talks about anything ever again. Or worse yet, you're like, I said that in session zero. Yeah, I know it's game... sixteen months ago. Right? Yeah, I know it's I know it's sixteen months later, but uh, you should have remembered. It's on the I sheet said... in the middle of the table. Right. You, know? you signed a contract. You know. Oh God, those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. So you know, no. it, but it's it's a continuing conversation. It's an evolving conversation, and like you did this with me mm -hmm. um, in your seven C, your last seven C game. Yeah. Um, my character is kind of a kind of a gun bunny, and was really kind of the like. I did go out of my way to make her the, like, kind of remorseless killer. You did. It was a major plot point for her because she was bathed in blood constantly from yeah. an early age and because of her magic and stuff like that. And I think it just broke something in her, you know? Which made sense. Um, And so I was trying to push that line and be that sort of, like, anti-hero rather than a, you know, proper hero mm -hmm. with her. Um, And at one point, my character, we were getting... uh. Uh, boarded by pirates they were on their way they were like, on their way long my boats were coming pulled out a long rifle mm -hmm. took aim and just sniped the uh the their their leader not their the bosun. captain but their bosun their bosun right in the head 
And the entire pirate fleet basically just turned around and was like, like, nope. Okay. Okay. We see you. Yeah. And I mean, my character and to an extent myself didn't kind of see what was wrong with that of like pirates were coming onto the ship. They were going to murder us. Like, I'm sure they weren't showing up for a pinochle tournament, you know. I just got to the killing quicker than them, and suddenly I'm the jerk. But yeah, we, you know, you, you, you told me in character that there were consequences for that. Mm-hmm. You threw my character in the brig, mm-hmm. um, and you told me that that was essentially murder that broke the code of the high seas, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and you also talked with me, kind of as a person of like, do you understand why that happened in game? Do you understand why the consequences happened? Yeah. Um, and but. You were sure to reinforce that with me that, like, essentially that was a no-no in your story. Right. You know? Right. It's It, it was the leveling of the concept of chivalry goes out the door when you kill a person at that range. Like, it's, you, it's no longer, like, you're waiting for them to arrive and have your moment with them and a discussion and or discussion at sword's length, you know? And it's it's the you know uh, as I like to put it uh, uh, from Red uh, retired and extremely dangerous like you know she could have hit me here in my head instead she hit me here mm-hmm. in my heart you know it's part of that as well as like uh, it, there's a heartless moment in just taking a life at a distance and for that it's 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 not what others agree with like it's it seems wild and mad now does it happen sure. Is there consequences? Of course. And understanding that within the story then starts setting other things in motion with reputation and framing. And that all can transpire within the game. It's not a punishment as long as it's a discussion of, is this what you intended to do? Or do you want this to just be marked as a background that you need to resolve? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's a big difference. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I um, didn't I didn't see it as a punishment. I just saw it as a direct consequence of my actions. Yep. Which is great. And play continued. Yep. Yep. We just kept moving on, mm-hmm. and everything was fine with that. Yep. And I think that's, I think that's an inherent thing about the mechanics of combat, is that there are other things your characters can do. the The system is not all about this is what it must do. Right. Mm-hmm. If I and, and, and yeah, I'm going to step away from the concept of I'm putting the fireball here. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. That's, it's the hand grenade getting tossed in the space. I'm sorry. It's going to do what it's going to do. But more to the line of like I have the ability as a, as a magic user to shape what I am doing and control it to a degree. There's nothing to say that I don't make the icicles go shooting through their bodies, but instead encase them and and put spears at their throats yeah 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 okay it's still getting the job done Mm -hmm. and as a storyteller you can accept that Mm -hmm. you can be like okay they are pinned and clearly not moving yeah right they're gonna need assistance to leave this space Mm -hmm. or even like spearing them through a body part pinning them to a spot they're, they're not going anywhere sure it was critical enough it did the hit points worth of damage since hit points aren't actual physical body parts mm-hmm. and we know this yeah, right yeah. so there are all kinds of ways to craft combat in such a way that it is not as brutish and 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 dark and 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 carnal you know where you are a psychopath trying to murder everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, the the thing is, is that, uh, like, I don't think it's stated enough in most rule systems that the rules are essentially suggestions. Yeah. Um, and specifically this part. Yeah, specifically this part uh, that that, you know, th- those are just tools for adjudicating the story. Mm -hmm. You know, and that telling the story in the most interesting way, it kind of like leans into rule of cool, you know, a lot. And and I I think there's there's a certain school of thought that says that, you know, adhering to the rule as written is, you know, your best guide, because that way it gives everybody a baseline for exactly what's going on in the story. And I and I get that. That's that's definitely, you know, a take on it. But like. I think allowing yourself the flexibility to say, wouldn't it be neat if I could do this? Rather than just dealing 43 points of damage and killing the man. Just Mm -hmm. because it says that Cone of Cold can't be used for, you know, stun damage or subdual damage or whatever, you know. Technically, there is no subdual damage in 5th edition D&D anymore, you know. Like, they... 
technically you can't do it by the rules. Right. But the overriding rule of any storytelling game is you can do anything the storyteller is okay with. Yeah. Yeah. And so if I say, yeah, I want to entrap him with ice, you know, I did enough, I did enough hit point damage to kill him. Right. Okay. By the rules, my spell did its job. Right. What I would like to happen is this. Right. I don't want this man to die. You've got a choice there as a storyteller. You can either look at it and say, sorry, the book says it does this much hit points. He die. He takes this much hit points. You obliterate him. Or you can say, I respect the fact that you're trying to make the choice to mm-hmm. take a nonviolent end to this. And yeah, that sounds perfectly feasible. You're a master of magic. Of course you could twist your magic like that. Yeah. I took away his bending. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, exactly though. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing is once it's bested, it can be, things can be changed, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and that's, that's the only thing is, is that as the, on the other side of that coin, there is nothing to say that you don't have the ability to just run, to just yeah. try and flee. Right. You know, not every hero sticks around, mm-hmm. especially when they know things aren't going well, or they immediately see if this is not going to, we're not going to have any win here. Yeah, exactly. And I would say most people don't stick around. Yeah. Uh, and that's the norm. And that's kind of where I wanted to talk a little bit about survival instinct, which I think is a major crux of this issue. I, I, could, I tend to agree with you on this. I, I, I want to, I want us to scope this just a little bit. Sure. But yes. Is that, that. Survival instinct is never written in the books. It really isn't. It isn't. It really isn't. It talks a lot about, you know, what happens when your hit points hit zero, or you take enough wounds to, you know, become incapacitated, how you bleed out, how healing, you know, works and stuff like that. But very seldom do you see how to run a realistic combat from a standpoint of including things like morale Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Or even having players understand those things as the events are transposing. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, that this is causing trauma, you're going to get the heck out of there. Yeah, sure. I mean, druids, by nature, are tied to nature. Nature is going to take care of itself. It's not going to stick around till the bloody end. Yeah. You know, it's 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 going to survive. Mm-hmm. That's its first thing it's going to do. Why that's not written for every ranger and druid in the books, I don't know. Yeah. Because it's the most blatant one. And... It helps level that concept of a berserker, someone who loses their mind in combat and can't stop fighting, now actually has meaning. Role play meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Versus, I'm a fighter and I will fight to my death. Why? Why? Do you not have, like, any self-preservation? Are you the type of guy who goes to plays poker and goes all in on every hand? Because that's essentially what you're saying. Yeah. You know? I'm I'm never going to leave the table. I have to win. Mhm. Oh, okay, you're terrible at this. Yeah. 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 So survival instinct. Yeah. Let's talk about this a little bit. Living things generally do not want to die. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of against is, the concept. That's survival instinct 101. If it, it is an instinct because even non-sentient creatures have this. Yeah. It is a core mechanic of the basis of how our brains work in general. Um, even insects know to avoid danger. Yeah. Um, and they do it in some pretty complex ways, too. Yeah, and and they'll do it as groups. They'll do it all kinds of ways. Sometimes they will sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Sure, but, like, they'll leave pheromone clouds that warn everyone yep. away from, you know, from, from the thing. Yeah. You know, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, even if the, the most basic life forms that we have, um, you know, on the planet understand survival instinct, why don't your NPCs? Yeah. So, most things you fight in a tabletop RPG, most things, robots, gelatinous cubes, things like that, aren't going to have survival instinct, sure, but most things you're going to fight are going to. Even trained soldiers, because I yeah. think that's probably the first defense you're thinking of. Yeah. Oh, well, my NPCs, they're not, they're not just any dudes. These guys are trained soldiers. Good. Then they should know battle doctrine enough to know to get out of that i assure you that seal team six knows when to gtfo yep (laughs) so here's some numbers for you and and these numbers are very loose approximates here i am i'm i'm not digging into wikis or actual battle doctrines for this or anything like that okay but first off taking 10 percent losses in in combat Mm -hmm. for most military folks 
is seen as considerable solid defeat. Yeah. 10% losses. Okay. Even if there's only 10 bandits and you killed one, that was Carl, and Carl had a family who wanted to be, and, and he wanted to be a painter someday, and now he will never paint again. Well, not only that, like, 10% of a ship mm-hmm. is a whole shift. Yeah. You can't sail properly. You're done. Yeah. Like, <laughs> death yep. on the sea is bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so his, like, you know, you kill, you kill one out of ten bandits and, like, the rest of his friends are going to be like, oh, crap, they killed Carl. Mm -hmm. Guys, Carl is dead. Things got serious now. Yeah. I mean, think, think of if you've been at a party with ten friends, look, just look at your gaming group, pick one, one of you dies. Are the rest of you sticking around? To handle that situation. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. If you have the option to leave. If you have the option to leave, are you sticking around at that point? No. I, I'm willing to bet not. Okay. Yep. Now, let's take this up a notch. Taking 50% losses is generally where we start tossing around the words things like getting wiped out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whole units will disband over these sorts of losses. And have. Yeah. You simply cannot continue... Uh, with the, with these losses of manpower and the psychological impact on, on on the living team members is going to be catastrophic. Yeah. Okay. These are people. Mm, excuse me. These are people you have worked with. Mm -hmm. These are people you have lived with. Especially if you're 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 a trained group. Yeah. Exactly. Imagine half of the people in the room no longer being there. Yeah. Imagine the therapy bills you will need for that. Yeah. Okay, again, if you watch half of the people in, 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 in the room with you get murdered, are you sticking around to fight? Here's, here's the other thing that, like, if you, if you don't want to think about this in terms of murder, because it's a hard thing, think about it like your, your job. You work on a shift, and the CEO comes in and says, we're killing, you know, we're taking out 10%. And 10% of your Laying team... Laying you off. Yeah. Gets, you know, pink slips. Okay, that's hard. 50% of your group gets pink slips. How do you feel about your job? Probably pretty darn demoralized. Yeah. And those people you can still have a beer with after work. Yeah, who are really going to be angry. Mm-hmm. All right. And then we take it up one more notch. Taking 100% losses, just think about that, is generally considered excessive, even genocidal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hunting a group to the last man. Mm-hmm is something that is only done deliberately and to murder them specifically. You yeah. are going out of your way to kill them because they're probably fleeing at a well 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 above the 50% mark. Mm -hmm. If you have kept engagement with them long enough to kill every last one of them, you've probably done it deliberately and you've done like you're well past the point of reason. Yeah. Your your boss comes to you and says you need to let go one member of your five-member team, or three members, or you have to let go all five. How are you feeling about that? Mm-hmm. You have to go. That's just a conversation. Yep. Yep. And and that's hard to have with people you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, look, this sounds like a grim conversation, but, I mean, we are, That's that's the whole point. Yeah. I think, is that in a lot of instances, we take the consequences of combat way too lightly. Mm -hmm. This is killing. It should be weighty. It should be grim. You shouldn't be able to just, like, day after day, just slaughter nameless numbers. Well, not only, and if we're, t if, even if we're not talking about death, even if we're just talking about, like, roadhouse mm -hmm. where we're just gonna punch everybody out and throw them out the windows and toss them into the street you just cleared a room of people yeah the rest of those people are gonna look at you very differently for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and there's so much normalization that's happened in media that that's okay yeah. right and that that we can accept that mm -hmm. the, the the body bag count can be high it it can be there's nothing if you want to play that route that's nothing wrong with that but at the same time 
that is not necessary. We don't need to continue that for it to have a story because that story ends there. Especially when it's a body bag. If the person's incapacitated, you can have a story that continues off of that. If that person runs away and retreats, you can have a conversation that follows that up. More story can come of that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts never takes prisoners. That's interesting. How'd you find that out? From a story. Hmm. Where do the stories come from, then, I, haven't, I wonder? Exactly. Yep. That is the truth of those matters. Exactly. Um, so, okay, there is... One note to say about fleeing or fleeing or surrendering here. Okay, so obviously we've we've talked about how basically most people will bug out at like between slightly around the ten percent mark, maybe mm -hmm. a little lower if they're really intent about things. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if the enemy is bloodthirsty or like deliberately trying to cause casualties, they might have a higher stake in it. They might stick around a little bit longer, or. Conversely, if there's something worse in store, if they do not continue fighting, yes. that happens occasionally. Um, a pretty good example of it um, was like World War II Russian army. Yeah. Um, you know, they had a not not a single step backwards uh, policy, basically, where they lined up their political officers behind their 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 ranks, and basically, if anybody tried to retreat, they would get shot. Thomas Harvest shoot them. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. or you know, you see it also a lot, like in mob tactics, of like you know. Uh, no, you know, you can't torture me. My boss will do, th you know, uh, so much worse to me if I, if I talk. Yeah. You know, sort of things. I ain't no snitch. Yeah. So, you know, th there is, there is a case to be made. And so these, these aren't like hard rules, but there's something you should really consider that like most of these combats 12 V four or whatever they are. Like you kill three of those dudes. You don't have to kill the other eight. Or, you know, nine, however many there. I can't math. I'm You're fine. I'm a role player, you know. Um, Twelve, nine. You're good. Nine, yeah. You don't have to kill the other nine dudes. They're leaving. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Or they're throwing weapons. Yeah. Yeah, they'll drop their weapons. They'll cut, run, surrender, whatever. But, mm. like, we can move away from that combat scene once those first couple, you know, first couple bodies hit the ground, whether they're unconscious or whether they're dead. Right. All right. Even wild animals. Yeah. Have survival instinct. Now, this is another one I've heard a lot. Like, oh, the wolves are hungry. That's why they fought to the last person. No, they don't. No, they don't. Okay. Non-sentient beings also have survival instincts. Um, in fact, I would say that's their only driver. Since they aren't sentient, they don't have... They can't pursue, like, higher learning or cultural mm -hmm. goals. Like, they don't care about spirituality. They're not doing this for the sake of their god or their nation. They're doing it to fill their belly. Um, or they're doing it to protect their territory, okay? Wild animals want some basic things. Shelter, safety, food and water, and procreation. Mm -hmm. um, if any of these basic needs are threatened, most animals will fight or they will flee. Those mm -hmm. are the only two options for them. Injury is a huge disincentive for them to fight, mm -hmm. okay? Look at it this way. Why do porcupines exist? They are little meat nuggets with stubby little legs that eat vegetables. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's very true. <laughs> they chew very... on grass and sticks and they make a cute little noise with their little hands. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, they're also covered in quills. And that does some remarkable things for the defense. Um, so if a coyote, like a coyote sees a, sees this little porcupine meat nugget, which mm -hmm. is just a meal on stubby little legs, chewing on his grass, mm -hmm. the coyote doesn't do a DPS calculation. No. Right? The coyote doesn't look at that porcupine and go, if I kill it before it kills me, then it's worth fighting. You yeah. know, I can, I can win this fight. I can take this. Yeah. Right. What it's going to think to itself is, if I attack that, it's going to hurt. I will get quills stuck in my face, mm -hmm. which will continue to hurt. That injury will make me slow. Mm -hmm. It will make me distracted, yep. less able to eat other things, and it may make me sick, either from the stress or from infection from the quills. Yep. I will become food for other things instead of surviving myself. I am going to avoid the spiky potato. Yeah. Exactly. And a group of wolves will look at one who's injured and say, you're not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. You slow us down. Yeah. You're going to get us killed. 
Oh, Knox put a spiky potato. Oh, in spiky the... potato, the little hedgehog. Oh, he's so yes, cute. exactly. But but exactly. That's you know that's why things like that work. Like you take the quills away from a hedgehog. That's all they are is spiky potato. snacks. They really for are larger creatures, but they proliferate because there's a huge disincentive. Sure, you could bite through those. It would hurt, but you would still get the meal on the the end of it there. Yeah. But what good are you like you? They don't have dentists. They mm-hmm. don't have hospitals. Mm-hmm. They're wild animals. They take an injury. It could screw them up for life. Mm-hmm. And that life will be very short because something else that's higher than them on the food chain is going to pick them off the moment they show weakness. Okay, and, and this applies to other things. D&D monsters notwithstanding. Like, yeah. if, if you have a displacer beast mm-hmm. that is going around attacking things and it gets one of its tails lobbed off... One of its weaponized parts, it's probably going to take off. It yeah. is going to just not want to be anywhere near what's going on. Exactly. Unless it needs to defend something or it's doing something in a pack mentality of like, okay, I'm going to take this hit. I'm going to Gandalf this. You guys go. Or or get around the other side of it. You know, I'm mm-hmm. gonna I'm gonna be the clever girl, you know. Yeah, sure. And draw the attack so you guys can pincer. Yeah, there's absolutely such things as pack tactics and stuff like that. But right. also you gotta keep in mind that, you know, there there's the whole reason the euphemism fighting like a cornered animal exists. Yeah. Because that's the only time that wild animals actually really viciously fight. All yeah. other times it's a simple calculation of can I win the fight? No, then I'm out. Yeah. Cause it's not worth fighting for. There'll be another day. I, I, I stub my toe, I break my ankle, I, you know, I break my jaw or something like that. I'm as good as dead in the wild. I, I I'm will, leaving. I dare say that that right there, like, next time you stub your toe and you're holding it, think about how much more you want to keep fighting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So, we talked about sentient creatures. Mm-hmm. We talked about non-sentient creatures. All of these things apply. Yes. Except Pepped. to zealots. Oh god, yeah. And that coming back to the, you know, raging barbarians. Yes, exactly. These are people who are blind. They right. are they have moved beyond their animal brain and have created a, sh- a a slice in there. Yes. Yes. That now says this is what we must do. I have drive to do this. Now, this is this is where I talk a little bit about storytelling like contrast. Okay. Um, and this is why I think it's very important to show survival instinct for most, if not all, other NPCs in your game. Yeah. Okay. Consider consider this this campaign, okay? Every time you've gotten into combat, people have feared for their lives. People have surrendered. People have run away. They've done whatever they possibly could to just keep on going, okay? Mm-hmm. You have set an expectation at your table that that is how people act in your story. Mm -hmm. They put their lives above whatever they're doing. Okay? Think of how frightening it would be when you get in a fight, you kill three out of the ten people, you think to yourself, oh, this is this got to be... We just killed three of them. They got to be running now. And four of them pull out... Molotovs or something like that, and come running at you. Now, if this is any game of, you know, any, I would say, normal murder hobo game, that's just a target-rich environment. But if you've set the expectation that people value their lives, when all of a sudden somebody is willing to die for what they believe in, that has so much more impact for you. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about with fanatics and zealots, is people who are willing to die. They are the, the people who are willing to throw away their lives. And that shouldn't be shouldn't be taken lightly, you know? In real life, that is what makes most terrorists really frightening, is because they, they have reached that point. These are actual, honest-to-goodness people, not just made-up people in a fantasy land, but real people in the real world who have decided that death is an acceptable loss to accomplish whatever goal that they've got. Yeah, I mean, Overwatch makes an interesting point, uh, or I wouldn't say counterpoint, but a point within this, that there are groups like Vikings, which were a f- which had within their ranks, but it was their entire life mm-hmm. and lifestyle and culture 
was wrapped around that concept of courage in everything. Sure, sure. You know, but courage also didn't mean stupidity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and and it's stupid to go alone and fight alone to the death. Yeah. Because you lose everything. Yeah. That was the one thing about the Viking culture was is that if you did lose, you lost everything. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, your your children didn't get your crap. And so, in that, it there were points where, obviously, you, you have to calculate and make decisions, and they did. They were very good at warfare because of that, but they were also very courageous in what they did. So, there's a line to be drawn there to say, well, well what about the Vikings? The Vikings were Vikings for a reason. When they came to your shores, they were terrifying. Mm-hmm. To everyone else. Not everyone was a Viking. Yeah. Uh, Sean says also the samurai with Bushido. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I agree. I completely agree. Yep, exactly. Basically, you enter the battlefield with the assumption that you are already dead. And if you live, that's a pleasant surprise. Yeah. But again, those are outliers within a society. Sure, sure. And are meant to feel that way. Mm -hmm. So that when when people look at those, they look at them sometimes in reverence, in fear, a little in, bit of both. <laughs> and, and sometimes both at the same time. Yeah. You know, and and for that, it it carries a different weight within the story right. of that existence. But understand that unless you're playing Legend of the Five Rings or unless you're playing, um, you know, something that features Vikings heavily or has a, you know, like Klingons, I assume, would work exactly the same way. Klingons, I absolutely see throwing their lives away. You know, it's a good day to die, you know. Yeah. Sure. Okay. No, absolutely. Throw your Klingons, you know, uh, with reckless abandon into battle. Absolutely. They they should be doing that. But, like, your average Federation dude mm-hmm. should be like, guys, can I get beamed out of here? We're all going to die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Agreed. 100% agree. Mm-hmm. So. And even if you uh, discount it to the point of life, uh, within some stories, life is not so meaningful because the physical form doesn't mean anything. Like, in the, in the case of Nova Praxis, where it's like, well, I can just be resleeved. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The psychology is still there. It still hurts and sucks to die. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No matter how many times you've done it. Mm-hmm. And actually, there, there's a mechanic for if you do it too often, it starts to really screw your brain up. Right. One of our characters is actually a doctor, essentially, that's there to help people ease that transition and put themselves back together after they die, so... So let's let's get to the the the, the final the actual education. meat of the conversation, yeah, so which so, is this. <laughs> we told you all that so we could tell you how to actually end a combat <laughs> to, to get you comfortable with it. Like, why would I even care about this stuff? Well, that's why you care, right, 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 right. And to be honest, drying out long combat is boring. It is having like is. the crew still standing there fighting the last four skeletons after the the main bad guy's dead is yeah. pointless. Yeah, it is. Like, if you're willing to do that for the big bad guy fight. If, like, the layer actions just suddenly dissolve away and everything else happens so you can do the end scene, doesn't – can't that just happen whenever it's necessary? Yeah. Like, so do that. Mm-hmm. Like, stop making fights dumb and long. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Stop adhering to the rules at, at the detriment of your story and your pacing. And and there's nothing to say that, they, that the characters can't recognize that. Like, the fifth element does this beautifully. Like, he looks in, sees who who these guys are. They're a bunch of mercenaries that always have a leader. They find that leader. Once we, we, we take care of that situation, great. And I'll go negotiate with him, a.k.a. I'm going to put a round in his head <laughs> so this gets done now. Yep. You know, and Oliver's like, oh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> How I don't many have are there? A... Twelve. Blam, 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 blam. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get the numbers down low enough. Like, now that he knows, okay, there's the leader, now we can do this. That kind of mentality is cool. That can work. Mm. There's nothing wrong with that mentality. Um, but I think as a storyteller, you need to telegraph that. You need to make sure your players are aware that, that A, not only that the hits are coming, but there are options for exit, for egress, for other things to happen. Yes, Yes. You know, the sweat on the brow of people who are getting ready to get into combat can tell you enough to say that maybe they're not ready for this. And and I think I think it's important to to like, you know, again, yeah, yes and your players lean into allowing them to do this sort of thing, you know. Uh I, I think like by Dungeons and Dragons rules like, cuz I you know, I I mean I ran my own 5th edition campaign for a couple of years yeah. there. Um and there was always that option of like, okay, if you guys want to run, you know, 
the rules don't really have a lot to say about escaping from combat. Nope. They have a lot to say about what your movement speed is and what the movement speed of the enemy is. Mm -hmm. And so you look at that and you're like, okay, well, I move 30 feet and they move 30 feet. So if I want to flee from combat, essentially they can just stay on me and just keep attacking me. You know, sure. Because we're still thinking in combat terms, because that's all it gives you to think about, right? Sure. Um, Savage Worlds is a bit better with it. I can transition that to a chase scene. Mm -hmm. You know, there are rules for that, so you could use rules to see if you can successfully evade. Mm -hmm. Combat can even continue in the chase scene. There's rules for sure continuing fighting with people while moving, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, but. The point is, though, is that if your players say, you know, guys, I don't think we're going to win this one. I think we should run. Okay. Or we should negotiate. Your answer yeah. to that shouldn't necessarily be, okay, well, the combat rules say your movement is this, their movement is this. Therefore, when you try to flee, they kill you. Yeah. They catch you and kill you. Let, let them escape. Sure. Maybe maybe make some athletics rolls or, you know, something that, even if you don't have set chase rules in whatever system you're using, um, do something that simulates maybe a pursuit, you know? Um and don't don't make it like, you know, life or death pursuit. Mm -hmm. Maybe make it if they fail, they might lose an item or something like that. I mean if they've um, already taken casualties, yeah. Lost resources. Like the the consequences for that battle in the story have already been met. Yeah. And and the thing is, is that even even if you just walk away from that situation or like, hey, you OK, so you guys escape and hide into, you know, you're or, or slip into the night and they're 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 looking after you, but they can't seem to find you. You stealth away or whatever. Right. They're not the, you know, the group is going to go and try and have to hide from them. Now you've got more story actions to keep going. Right. You've got more story to tell. Let the players enjoy the story. Yeah. Make, yeah. Maybe they have to get somewhere safe before they can rest, right? So now it's a challenge there. I mean, if you really want to keep driving down their resources, that's not a bad way to do it, and it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. that they're being pursued. But it doesn't have to be a roll-to-roll-to-roll -to -roll -to -roll pursuit. Yeah. It's just a the consequence of this pursuit is that you cannot take a short or a long rest. You can relax, you can have meta discussions, mm -hmm. but literally you, you can't get enough available space to be able to do that. Oh, well, we're, you know, we're going to burn our Leo Min's hut. Okay. Within the time period, there is, you know, they're already figuring out that you're there. Mm -hmm. Like they detected it. Yeah. So now you've got a, a, a different layer of combat that comes into that, mm -hmm. you know. But the idea is, is that you're you're yes anding with your players. You're giving them the option to continue the story beyond combat being a requirement. Yeah. yeah. Likewise, there is nothing that says that right in the middle of combat the free action known as speech can't change the entire combat. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. I love the concept of players being able to just be like, whoa, 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 let's just can we all just pause right here? Just pause? Yes. Yes. You know? Exactly. And, and, like, what is your purpose of you, of you having this conversation? Are you attempting to do something? No, no, no. I'm literally trying to stop this combat. Okay, go ahead and talk. All right, and I'm talking to everybody, including players right there. Mm -hmm. If the villain does that, let them monologue. Yeah. Let yeah. them monologue. Man, us storytellers are gearing up for that. We have written whole speeches. We have practiced them every time we are on the toilet. We are mm -hmm. in the shower. We are on our commute. We have We have whole speeches built up in our brains and then we start to monologue and somebody inevitably bursts out i shoot him yeah i'm done with this conversation yep let and us monologue yep I, and i think the other part of this conversation to the players is try other things mm -hmm. you don't just have to keep rolling through combat there is nothing that says you can't do something different yeah and i think i think that, you know that's it's it's a um it's kind of a Mexican standoff at the table mm -hmm. a lot of times where the players don't try anything new because they don't think that their storyteller will allow it. Mm -hmm. And the storyteller doesn't prompt them to try anything new because he sees his players just having like he wants them to try something new, but they're not. And so he assumes that they're having fun just murder hoboing their way through the fight. 
Yeah. You know, I was, uh, take the chance, try something, try talking, try surrendering, try fleeing. There's a, there was a D and D DM who was talking about his group. And one of his players was a, uh, a wizard who effectively as he thought was a pacifist, you know, basically wasn't in combat fighting, mm -hmm. was hiding, mm -hmm. was doing like stealth checks, which he was crappy at mm -hmm. and trying just to avoid combat as much as possible. And he was just like, man, he's just he's making this game very hard. And every one of the storytellers that were in there, like I would say, even the ones who said like, OK, well, have you talked to them like or anything? We're just like, what do you do for his game? What do you mean? Well, is your game just an OSR dungeon crawl combat, combat, combat? Well, we, we get through about two combats a session. OK, so what is he doing? Like, what does he get to do? Mm -hmm. What When does he get to play his character? Well, I mean, if you join into the combat, like, okay, did you tell him he needed to be a combat monster like the rest of the group? Yeah. Well, he's like, whoa, whoa, not the whole party is combat monsters, but everybody's combat ready. Okay. Well, but if you you're didn't... doing two combats a game, what else are you doing? Exactly. And his, the whole, that, that storyteller was like, well, we do all of our other stuff in Discord. And then we do our combats on our sessions. Okay. And I'm like, that's not, what do you, you're not accomplishing things. Like, well, clearly narrative is not important. Mm -hmm. It was an OSR game, but he never told that player that and never opened story to that player. Yeah. yeah. And it was like, maybe that player just needs to go to a different table because yeah. your table is clearly a combat table. Exactly. And clearly that player doesn't, is not interested in the combat. Yeah. And interested in a more, more, I would say, realistic portrayal of combat, which is, I don't want to be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like, I, I say, watch your tables, learn your tables, but at the same time, players look for other things. Yeah. Don't get stuck in the board game design of my character is full of damage dealing things and I need to deal damage. That is not the only thing you can do. Mm -hmm. There are plenty other ways. Even Jabba the Hutt had self-preservation. He was smug about it. He was cool about it. Cool as a cucumber. But cool that as thermal a... detonator in his freaking chamber was terrifying. Right. And everyone else there knew that. They were all moving away. Yep. Jabba doesn't sweat because he's a mob boss, and I'm not sure that uh, a hut is capable of sweating in the first place. But, yeah. but, when he's like, ah, ha, 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 this bounty hunter's my kind of scum, I believe is the line. Yeah. You can read between the lines there where he goes, oh, okay, cool your jet, put the damn bomb away. Yeah. It's, it, ain't, it ain't worth it, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this isn't going to get the results that you think it is. You can absolutely, like, you can, you, okay, you convinced me, fine, you can have Solo and the Wookiee, whatever, but, sure. like, just put, please, put the bomb, oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're we're good, we're copacetic again, you know? Yeah. So, keep that in the framework of, of your head. Mm-hmm. That... Every and everybody recognized that person meant business because it wasn't all about murder, murder, murder. Yep. So, so to sum up, yes. Survival instincts. Yep. Nobody fights to the death unless they're a fanatic. Mm-hmm. Storytellers, yes, and your players T allow them to take those options, offer them those options, and telegraph when bad things are coming, exactly. so that they can weigh their options exactly players do some different things do some different things not everything has to be killing yep we're all better than that yep yep we do have questions we do have some questions even some last minute questions that i'm very happy about because i forgot to submit i'm gonna do better this week i promise mm -hmm. so nevim asks with the help of smart moves and luck the players are to kill slash take down the enemies just after the starting after starting combat should I let them enjoy their quick win? Should I buff up the enemies on the fly to make the combat last a little longer? Depends. Yeah. What is your group there for? How does your group have fun? Yeah. Are you there to play the board game aspect of Dungeons and Dragons where you have built combat monsters and you're going to feel cheated if you don't get to cast Eldritch Blast, you know, for a 47th time that day? Then make the combat last longer. Yeah. But or are they professionals 
and therefore they, much like a you know, secret agent take down seven thugs walking in the door in one round of combat because to they're that good. Go do the challenging thing. Yes, you know exactly. Um, so it, that's that's really a judgment call. Um, at, at your table. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes your your players want to fight more. Sometimes they're going to be high fiving each other, going, "Dude, that took one round. That was amazing." Uh, for for my money. I'm sorry, I have to laugh. I think we didn't hear it, but we got played out. <laughs> Did we get played out? Oh. Knox says, I hear the end theme very faintly. Yeah. I, 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 we, I can't see it. I think the bar... I, we, we, we have some engineering stuff going on today. This is a terrible show. I'm sorry, everybody. We'll give you, a, we'll give you another one next week that's better than this. We're going to take a mulligan on this one. Oh, my God. I feel so bad about this. <laughs> But in any case, in any case, uh, when we're talking about uh, dealing with combat and quick wins, it's about looking at the table and talking and figuring out how your players are playing the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, even in my game, I had by the end had to make a decision about D and D and basically not play D and D because it, I knew it wasn't going to be enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. But you have to be able to have those conversations with your players. You have to be able to weigh that with them as well. Uh, there's there's also a um, a school of thought with D and D, especially for like fudging the numbers and whatnot, that yeah. you're essentially cheating your players out of the mechanics uh, of the game. Yeah, out of the mechanics of the game by by fudging things. Mm -hmm. Um, I I mean I've I've kind of fudged things before in the past with you, where like there are rules for how to set up a a, a monster and stuff like that in the monster manual and sure. whatnot, right? You know. What's their hit die? What's their constitution modifier? What's their challenge rating? Et cetera, et cetera. What kind of powers they have uh, are allowed? I just kind of went, mm, you guys can all do about 50 damage in the span of a combat. I'm going to give them 300. Yeah. That's it. He's got 300 damage, 300 hit points. Yeah. I'm going to eyeball that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that's the closest I've ever come. I know there is a another rule of cool of, like, once everybody at the table has gotten to do a cool thing mm -hmm. that they're excited about their character doing, that's when the that's when the enemy dies. Yeah, you know, if everything connects. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so, I, I, it re again, it really depends on your pacing. It really depends on 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 your table. Yeah. On that one. Second question: The combat is taking too long. Everyone is getting bored. How can I end the combat smoothly without creating frustration? It depends on which direction combat's going at that point. If yeah. it's slogging and there you're at that point where things are attrition is not occurring. You really need to look at your at, you have control of your NPCs. Are they not winning? Mm -hmm. If they are not winning, then they need to start negotiating and and their own lives mm -hmm. and their own situation to handle that. Obviously, they're not prepared to lose their lives. Maybe they're going to back off. Yeah. You know, and it likewise, maybe encourage your players to do the same thing of being like, you guys are running out of resources. Might might be time to bail. Yeah. Have the NPCs offer them a surrender or offer right. to let them flee. Yep. You know, have your NPCs say something like, you know, hey, look, we know we... We don't, we don't, you know, we don't want any trouble or anything. It's not, it's not worth your lives. Just get out of here mm -hmm. and we'll let you live. Mm -hmm. You know, the, have them gloat over the PCs. Sure. You, you took your lumps. Now get out of here. Yeah. You know, okay. Your pride's hurt. Yep. Maybe your hit point pool is hurt, but like, okay, you get to walk away and the combat's over at that point. Have them hurl insults from the walls as they flee with their tail between their legs. Your mother but, was a hamster. But the combat's <laughs> over now, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. You know, that's where I'd run home to mama, you yep. know? Okay, cool. But but combat's over. Yeah. And now... And the story continues. And the story continues. Yeah. And that's... The whole thing is, and the story continues. Mm -hmm. And understand that. That that's, that's a thing that can happen. Yeah. I've, I've read about people doing wipes where they're just like, and it's a half an hour later. You're bruised. You're broken, sitting on the rocks. Tell me how you guys got away. Yeah. Just give me the flashback. Sure. Sure. You know? Heck, if you're playing Savage Worlds, do it, as a, do it as an interlude. Yep. What happened to you as you were fleeing from the combat? Right. Like, and that's the thing is, is that if you, if you want to make it less mechanical, mm -hmm. 
then take it immediately to narrative. Yeah, then do it. Have have something grand step in. Like, another thing is, you know, if it is a standstill, there's nothing to say that the bigger bad guy can't step in with a, a larger entourage who is just like, and we're done with this little thing, aren't we? Mm-hmm. Why don't you go talk to your people? I think we've all learned our lessons. Yeah. Go tell the people you work for what happened here so they'll know not to mess with me. Yeah. And because of this, I'll respect when you come back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You did good, kid. I'll, I'll give you a gift if you walk away now, and that's your lives. Right. You know, it's things like that that you, you have the option to pause, evaluate, and decide how you want to step the story ahead. Mm -hmm. And that the story can continue. Yep, absolutely. And then DB added, uh, how do you feel about explicit objectives or win-loss conditions in regards to combat? For example, if a win, uh, uh, a win if a noble is successfully escorted out of the castle, or a loss if the noble is kidnapped or murdered. I'm, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to say I'm okay with them, but I'm going to put a big asterisk next to that. Sure. Okay. I think explicit win-loss conditions for a combat are okay as long as they are only used as a guidepost for you as a storyteller in the scope of your own notes to know how, how your narrative should proceed next via your... Flowchart. Your sort of flowchart, you know, what, what notes you've taken on, on what should, should or should not happen in the yeah. narrative. Um, I don't think those win-loss conditions should ever really make it to your player's I think it gamifies things too much, but a simple note in your own things of like, if he makes it out okay, X, Y, or Z will happen. If he does not, X, Y, or Z might also happen. Yeah. And and your players are going to do something different. Sure. The moment you set an explicit uh, condition of this or this, you know it's not going to happen that way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yes, they get away with the prince. But he also got hit by a poison arrow and took literally nine-tenths of his life. And you're fudging rolls to make it seem like he's alive. Mm -hmm. Are you not following the mechanics of the digital game that you've just built? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So I would say if it's part of your story notes, then it's just part of your story notes. Essential NPCs in Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he can't die. He's taken 10,000 points of damage. He can't die. Use him as a personal shield. Okay, now this is dumb. <laughs> With this NPC's death, the threads of fate are severed. <laughs> exactly. So that that's my only weight on that, is, is that I would say that you... Uh, that narrative is important. Mm -hmm. um, and just like any other challenge, don't lock plot behind a challenge yeah yeah if there if there is a possibility of failing always either have a way to get a like a way for the players to circumvent it or a contingency on what happens if it doesn't yes you know it is is the challenge over yes then evaluate how it was completed right not if they complete it successfully what does successfully mean mm-hmm Okay, now, now you're setting conditions for your characters to kill. Like like in, in this instance that I'm thinking of, like, okay, you need to protect this noble, okay? If your plot is based, like, if the continuation of your story is based around the noble saying, thank you for rescuing me from that dangerous situation, here is the information you're looking for that will lead you to the next plot point. If he dies, what then? Mm -hmm. How do they get to the next plot point? If the answer is, oh, God, I didn't think of that, You've done something wrong. You've locked your plot behind a success or failure of a test. On the other hand, if you have written in your notes that, like, if he dies, he will have a note on him that will, you know, with his dying breath, he'll be like, take this, you know, you so know. you make sure they, like, because they might not search his body. Or, or if, if they're captured, like, everyone's captured, mm -hmm. and the noble is taken away from them, and they're left in the powder keg room while it's on fire. Right. Like, that there's a note or something that leads them onto the One next plot point. One way or another, you need to get that information, Correct. that next plot point in there. So, Correct. Yeah. So never tie plot behind a, a win, a, a success or a failure. Mm -hmm. The success or failure are merely creations of consequence. It is always a, it is always, it is done and either an opportunity or a consequence. But it is done and. So 
we fail forward, we succeed forward. Mm -hmm. Both of those things are true. If there was anything that Mouse Guard taught me, it was that. Yeah, Axel. So... We have one more in this miniseries, and we're going to get it right. <laughs> All right. So the last uh, last episode in this miniseries is, uh, do we actually need combat? This is the one that's going to get deep. Yeah. We, we got deep in the weeds on this one. We got deep in the weeds on this one and realized that half of the show we were trying to write for this show was actually next show. Yeah. Because the two, the two discussions are very kind of interlinked. Like, how do you get out of combat and did you need to get into combat in the first place? It's kind of a big uh, one big thing. But there are a lot of settings like, uh, you know, where maybe you're playing children, like kids on bikes or something like that, where yeah. combat just isn't a thing that your characters are going to do. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to examine that, uh, forward and backwards. And, uh, I believe you can find us on Twitter at ST underscore conclave on Instagram at ST underscore conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night at 7 PM Eastern time on mixlr.com slash storyteller dash conclave. And uh, join us on our Discord. We uh, we get some really great questions from uh, from a lot of different people up there. Um, if you want to hear us answer it on the air, it does not have to be related to our show topic. No, nope. shoot it at us. We'd love Tell to us. talk about it. Yeah, you can find that link on our Twitter as well as storytellerconclave.com. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who help us out every single month, especially our name members, Knox in the Box, Subject, Sam, The Arkin Asylum, Sparkle Motion, Veteran, Hulavu, and Sean. We pr- truly appreciate your support. Our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find them at part- patreon.com slash arcane anthems or on Instagram at arcane anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. You can find them at geefrog.bandcamp.com uh, or on Google Music. And our outro music is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find them at freemusicarchive.org. And a big shout out as always to our family, Vicky and Sean. Thank, Thank you so much for loving and supporting us. All of our friends have sat with us at our tables over the years to give us these great stories to share with you and you, every single one of our listeners. We love you guys so much. Love you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>